I was asked to come in here to talk about my book, but I'm not going to talk about my book today because you can read it and I will say a little few things about it at the very end, but um, what I'm going to be talking about today is creativity. So I need one more little gift. You have a gift. Oh, Hand that back to her. Don't open it until I tell you to, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, creativity is in our DNA. This goes back 25 thousand years ago, give or take, I've heard different reports on how long ago it was, but these paintings were done by the Cro-Magnons in France and um, northern Spain, and they painted on cave walls. Now these people did not live in these caves. They had to live on the outside, you know, maybe under a little outcropping, but they had fires and stuff, so they couldn't be inside the cave. They would, you know, it'd be all smoky. So they lived outside, but these pictures were done about a mile inside the cave. They had to walk a mile to get to these pictures. So they weren't just graffiti, just somebody, you know, drawing on the walls. They were very purposeful. They were put there for a reason. And they're mostly animals. There were some other things. They did have a few people, but not very many and very un, un exacting, but they had a lot of animals. And archaeologists have looked at these and said, this is actually how the animals looked in this time period. So they're very realistic. And this was the first time any creature on Earth had ever done anything really creative. Be um, and man is the only man, the one that does it now. No other creatures do this. Only man does these things. Now these paintings, as I said, were way back in the cave. So when people went to see them at this time period, they had to get their little um, oil um, lights because it was dark back there and walk like a mile back into the cave. And then they could look at these beautiful pictures. And you know, some, not everybody was drawing these pictures on the wall. There were some artists that were, and, but I think we don't know for sure what else was being done or why, what they did with these, except that I can imagine that there were people that were playing instruments. There were people that were chanting. There were maybe some people dancing. It was probably a whole ceremony. And then there were a lot of other people sitting around and watching what was going on. Kind of like what we do today when we go to a concert or a movie or a play. We, we have some people that are creating up on stage and then a lot of people that are looking and watching what's going on. But these are beautiful, beautiful things and this was where creativity got started. So how many people in here are artists? Raise your hand if you're an artist. Okay, we have one, two, three, oh, that's a lot. You know, a lot, but we're in an art gallery, so that's probably not surprising because you're here because you're drawn to the art. What? Do you, how many hands do you think would go up if I asked that same question to a high school class? Any, any guesses? Not that many. Not that many. <laughs> yeah, statistically, they say about 10% of high school kids will consider themselves artists. And that's not just visual artists, that's musicians, writers, dancers, singers. Only about 10% of the kids by the time they get to high school consider themselves artists. Now if I were to ask that same question in a preschool class, how many in you, of you in here are artists? Every hand in the room would go up. Because when we're in preschool, we know we're artists. We know we have that creativity with us. We know we can act. We know we can play music. We know we can make pictures. We are born to create. It's in our DNA, as I said. So um, what I want you to do is, I want you to open up that little package that I gave you. This, little, this is your gift. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, they're Crayola crayons. Now what I want you to do with this package is, 
I want you to open up that patch of crayons and I want you to put it up to your nose and take a really big sniff of it. Do you recognize that smell? You know, I can guarantee that everybody's blood pressure went down about 20 <laughs> points right then in doing that. Because that takes you right back to that time when you were in preschool and you were free to create, you lived mm -hmm. to create. So when you get stressed out, I want you to put these beside your computer, and when you get stressed out and uptight, don't go get a pill or go get a glass of wine. Just take a big sniff of this box of crayons. <laughs> It'll bring your blood pressure down <laughs> and calm you down. Okay? Thank so. You. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I know. I love it. And I love that box of crayons. And let me tell you, you can do, as adults, we can do really good things with crayons. I, I, for some reason, we don't use crayons. But they're wonderful waxy mm -hmm. material mm -hmm. to paint with. So anyway, so man started out you know, painting on cave walls, 25,000 years or maybe more than that. And I've heard different um, reports. Come on, sit down. I have to give him a box of crayons too. <laughs> this is a gift I have for you. You're supposed to smell, you're supposed to smell the box of crayons. So it takes you back to your time when you could create. So um, anyway, 25,000 years ago, and um, there was a lot of creativity that went on through the years, but it was slow going for a long time. Creativity didn't come on fast. But the creativity was not just in the arts. It was in science and technology. Um, there were a lot of different areas that were creativity was going on. But I want to follow this thread that starts with the um, you know, painting on cave walls. And so we're going to do visual arts. We're going to look at that thread of creativity. So thousands of years went by, and I, you know, I'm not good on the numbers on these, but many thousands of years went by, and then the Egyptians came along. And they learned from the um, Cro-Magnons on how to paint on walls, because they did paint on walls, but they didn't do animals so much. They focused on humans, on people. And so they painted pictures of people on walls, and then somebody some creative person, because there was always one creative person that came up with a new idea, and somebody said, you know, we could do something else with this rock. We don't have to just paint on it. We could carve it. And they started carving these huge, bigger than life-size statues of the leaders of their culture. Now, these sculptures were, you could tell they were people, and maybe you could even recognize, I don't know what the people really looked like, but they might have looked like the real people. But they were very stiff. They were kind of formed into the form of the rock. So you can imagine that this was a piece of rock around this, and it's very stiff. The legs are straight, the arms are straight. Everything kind of fits into that rock. So then what happened is the Greeks came along after the Egyptians, and they learned from the Egyptians on how to carve people out of rocks. But somebody, and I can tell you it was a one specific person that would come up with an idea, always is. And then it gets shared with everybody else that's doing the sculpting, and they learn from it. But they learned how to take those figures and not have them stiff, but have their arms go out into space, have their bodies turn, and so they were much more naturalistic. So, so creativity grew in this area. They learned another way to do it. And like I said, there was one person that came up with the idea. We don't know the name of that person. Sometimes later on in history, we know the names of the people that think of the ideas. But the ideas are then spread out throughout the culture. OK, and then many thousands of years later came the Dark Ages. And we called them the Dark Ages because they were supposed to be a terrible time. But you know what? The most gorgeous Gothic cathedrals were created in this time period. And what man at this time learned to do was join his creativity together so that the stonemasons and the builders and the glassmakers and the sculptors and the painters all worked together 
to create these fabulous cathedrals that we still admire today beautiful things and they went way up into the sky they went so far up into the sky that they had to have thick walls to hold them up and these thick walls made it very dark inside so somebody another creator thought of how to take that weight off the walls and put them out in flying buttresses to take the weight off the walls and put it at the outside and that would open up the walls so that windows could be put in it and some other creator came along and looked at the sand on the ground and said, I think I can do something with that sand. I can make it into glass to make these windows. Now it's interesting that that same sand we use today to make silicon chips. So some other creator thought about that other thing to do with the sand. But then they also use the minerals to color the glass to make them beautiful colored stained glass and they put these into, into these gorgeous cathedrals, which I just love. And then we went into the Baroque period and people were painting on canvases and the, you know, the Greeks and the Egyptians also painted on flat surfaces and they painted people, but the people were very flat and the distance behind them was very shallow. It was just a wall, like right behind the people. Somebody came along, and we do know the name of the person that thought of this, Berticelli? Berticelli? Yes. Discovered linear perspective. Mm. He was an architect and an artist, and he discovered a way to make these paintings look like they went back into space. And we still use linear perspective today. And that was a one creator way back when thought this up. And it's gone on to today to keep doing that. In the Baroque period that followed this, there were other artists that figured out how to make these flat figures that the um, Egyptians and the Greeks, Greeks had flat figures too, um, make them more three-dimensional. They use shadow and they made it them look like they were actually living people, you know, so they were able to use shadow and light to do that. And this was in the Baroque period. And then we're, we're, we're hopping through history very fast here. We're gonna move to um, the um, Impressionist period. And now the Impressionists took a little different point of view. Before this, artists really tried to make things look like they look in the real world. The Impressionists were not so interested in reproducing on their canvases what was happening in the real world. They wanted to give you the impression of what they saw, how they felt about it. And so they were kind of using their own minds to come up with the reality that they put on the campus, canvas. So now that was the end of the 1900s and then we got to the 20th century and creativity exploded in the arts, just exploded, went in every direction. We had abstract expressionism, we had um, surrealism, we had minimalism. That was one of my teachers, McCracken. <laughs> <laughs> and we had pop art plus many, many other ways of doing art. Man was now going into his head and putting what was in his head out. Instead of just looking at the outside and putting that down, they took what they were thinking in their heads, whether it was melted clocks or a mass of color. They, man was infusing reality with what was the reality in his head. So creativity took a lot of different um, ways of going. Um, Man has the ability to visualize a different future than he, in his mind, than he sees in the world. And there's a, really a desire for more creativity right now. Corporations want more creative people. Um, countries want more creative people. The world needs more creative people. We need more um, Picassos. We need more Albert Einsteins. We need more Steve Jobs. We need more Elon Musks. There's really a need for creativity right now. And so what we want to look at is these are people, creators, 
who think differently. And they're all over the place. And I want to first emphasize that when you're talking about creativity, there's no such thing as creative people and non-creative people. Everybody's creative. It's just that some people use their creativity and some people don't. And so we want more people to use their creativity. We definitely do. And I have some ideas on how to do that. And I'm going to come to that in a few minutes. But first I want to talk about the two parts of creativity. There are two different parts to it. The first part is that initial idea that comes into your head. Maybe when you wake up in the morning, boom, wow, I just had a great idea. Or you're in the shower and something comes to your head. Or maybe you're driving your car. That's a real automatic thing to be doing, so your mind can come up with new ideas. And we call that part of creativity, we call that the spark. It's instantaneous. It happens very fast. And you go, wow, that's a great idea. And lots of sparks are you know, created in this world, but many sparks just fly away because that spark has to be acted on or nothing happens with it. And that's where the second half comes in. And we call that half the grind. And actually my book is really about the grind because that's the part where after that instantaneous spark takes hold, then you have to come in with your perspiration, your perseverance, your time, your effort. And this is what takes all the time afterwards that the grind but without the grind that spark is not going to become anything good you know so that's very important so um, I read a book by Josh Watts Wason and Josh Wason have you ever heard that name anybody no he was a prodigy chess player and he wrote a book called the art of learning. He was at eight years old, he was written up in all the papers. He was beating every chess master in the world. Eight years old. He was just, he was a prodigy. He was very creative. And then he got to be a teenager and I guess he had done everything he could do with um, his, you know, um, chess playing. So he turned to martial arts, a completely different area. And he became world-renowned as a martial artist. He was beating everybody world round. Well, he wrote a book called The Art of Learning, which is really about creativity. And what he says in his book is that in order to be creative, we need to have a beginner's mind. And the kind of mind that he was thinking of was not like the guys on the left side of the screen that are just sitting there passively reading a book, no. It's like the girl on the right side who is out there trying something new, trying experimenting, flying a kite. She's open to new learning and new ideas. And what happens with this active, creative person, they learn more and they learn more efficiently. So imagine your creators, your creators, all of you, imagine that you're going on an expedition to uncharted lands and in this um, on this exhibition exhi expedition <laughs> I didn't say that wrong expedition um, your um, progress is marked by your discoveries not by the miles that you cover okay so you start off this expedition with a spark and you go along and your, um, your resources are your observation and your resourcefulness in that exhibition. But as you go along on it, you somehow lose track of your initial spark. You don't know what it is. And so what do you need to do? Look at things differently again. Yes, you need to find a new spark. Yes, and you do need to look at things differently and you need to, in order to do that, you need to practice. 
okay? And that means you need to do things. And I'm gonna give you five different things of growing your creativity. Okay. You have to be making meaning as you're doing creative. And in order to do that, you have to sometimes develop, just what you said, develop a new way of looking at something. And I'm gonna give you some examples from my life because there was a time when I did no art. <laughs> I always wanted to be an artist. I studied art in college, but life got in the way and I had a job, got a job that took about 50 hours of my week and I had three children of my own and two stepchildren and I had a husband who was disabled. <laughs> I had no time for art, no time for art. And so, but I used my creativity in my jobs and my jobs were, were not what you would think of as creative jobs. The first one, my, for 18 years, I was a high school counselor. Okay, doesn't sound very creative. It's hard, but it's not creative <laughs> necessarily. And then the last nine years, I was a middle school administrator. Again, you wouldn't think that that would be creative. But I found a way to use my creativity in the jobs. And it started off when I was a high school counselor. In the 1980s, we had a problem that's recurring again today. I hate to say it but high school students were attempting suicide and com sometimes committing suicide at a very high rate at that time period. I'm not sure what made that happen, but it was happening. And we were very disturbed by it. Um, and we were looking for ways of dealing with this problem. And what do you think the first idea that came into everybody's head on what to, how to deal with this problem? Counseling. Hire more counselors, <laughs> yes. That was the first thing we said, we need more counselors. Well, you know what, that wasn't gonna happen. Proposition 13 was coming in, they had no money for counselors, there were not gonna be any more counselors. Whoever we were, that's what we had, and we had about 400 students each, we had a lot. But I got to thinking, when these kids are attempting suicide, they don't talk to their counselors about it. They don't talk to their parents about it. They don't talk to their teachers about it. The only way we ever found out about these attempted suicides and were able to prevent them was if some other kid that they talked to told us. And so I got to thinking, what's a creative way to deal with this problem? Let's make a group of peer counselors. Let's get these kids that other kids talk to, get them together, meet with them on a weekly basis, give them some good counseling skills, and let them know when it's really important for them to report what has happened to an adult. Mm -hmm. And that would be if that student is hurting themselves or hurting somebody else, Those, that's kind of it. And so we did that and we were able to circumvent some of those um, suicides and one I had was two people who were gonna commit suicide together, if you can imagine that. Mm -hmm. But we were able to stop a lot of them and we were able to bring it down because of that. And that was by, whoa, what happened? No, oh, please wait. Okay, we're gonna wait. Anyway, they, I've got lots more to say about looking <laughs> at things differently, so we'll, hopefully we'll get the thing back on. Um, but anyway, we were able to reduce the problem by thinking, looking at something differently, and it didn't cost us any money. I mean, we could have these kids in peer counseling group, it didn't cost any extra money. I don't know what's happened here. <laughs> Did I touch something wrong on this? I have no idea. Okay. But anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and keep talking. So, and then I became a middle school administrator and talk about having problems. Problems and crises happen on a daily basis in middle school. And I was a vice principal, so I was dealing with a lot of behavior problems. And what would happen a lot of times, there would be students in the classroom that would stare into space, look around the room, fiddle around with something, and not do their work. And when that happened, the teacher would oftentimes give them a work sheet and send them to my office. To, so they could work separated from everyone else. 
Well, they got to my office and they didn't work either. They looked around my office, they talked to me, they still didn't do their work. And so again, I'm thinking, how can I creatively work with this problem and turn it around? Mm -hmm. And so it so happened that I had an assistance dog. My husband was disabled and we had an assistance dog. And so I asked for permission to bring the assistance dog to school two or three times a week and be in my office. It's one of the things I did with the dog. And um, anyway, so she would sit on the floor in the office and then when these kids came in, I would say, take your worksheet, sit down. Oh, thank you. But now you're using the forward button. Oh, forward button. Oh, okay. <laughs> we flipped it around. Let's get to where we were. I don't know if it sits too long. Oh, okay. We yeah. may have it happen again, huh? <coughs> okay, we'll get back to it. We did the exhibition. Okay, here we are. Okay. So anyway, they sat down by the dog, pet the dog, and did their work. Because their focus was right there. It wasn't distracted by all those other things. So that was another creative way. Again, didn't cost us any money. I had the dog, used it. And then I, the other problems that I had were discipline problems. And these were kids that not only were um, not doing their work in class, they were disturbing, <laughs> disturbing the whole class, getting everybody off the task. And what would happen with them is the teachers would give them a discipline referral, send them to my office so I can give them a consequence, give them a lecture, and send them back to class. Well, what I found is that I was spending a lot of time with these kids. And the next year came around and I said, you know, I, I've got to find a way not to have my time spent with these discipline problems all the time. And so I um, made a list of the 12, it turned out there were 12 that I saw repeatedly. Mm -hmm. 12 boys, I have to say they were all boys. <laughs> and I called them into my office and I said, I'm gonna make you an offer. If you can go one quarter of this school year without getting one discipline referral, I will take you out to eat at an all-you-can-eat restaurant for lunch. Their mouths hung open. They said, what? Who's going to pay for that? And I said, I'll pay for it. It would be well worth it to me <laughs> to do that if I can not have you in my office every two or three days. And so I made the list of these 12 boys' names and put them on the wall of my office so everybody could see who they were. And if they came in with a discipline referral, they got their name crossed off the list. By the end of the quarter, eight of those boys had no discipline referrals. These are kids that had 10, 20 referrals every quarter, and they had none. Four of them fell off the wagon. They had a couple referrals, but the deal was you had to have no referrals, so they got their name crossed off the list. They didn't get to go to lunch. They could try again next quarter. But I took those eight boys out to lunch, and I can tell you, we had a fabulous time because these discipline problem kids are the most creative kids in the school, <laughs> and they're so fun to be around, and I just loved it. So that was, that was another thing. Then the third way that I used my creativity in my role as an assistant principal is, at this time period, now this is a real dated one because you know what happens with creativity is when somebody thinks of a new idea, it's no longer new after a while because everybody starts doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened with this because in our school at that time period we had exactly four computers in the whole school and they were in the library. We had a thousand kids. They could come in the library and use the computer for what, 10 minutes or something? but they weren't using computers in their school work. This was really strange to me because most of their parents worked in Silicon Valley and <laughs> wrote computer programs and were using computers all day long and here their kids were in the classroom using a pencil and paper and that was it. It was crazy. I thought it was just crazy. I said, why are we doing this? They're not, this is not, this is almost the 21st century, we got to get with a program. So I talked to somebody at Apple and we found a way to put computers in kids' hands and we started a laptop program 
where the teachers did all of the work on the computers and the kids did all their work on the computers. Now this, like I said, this is dated because now with COVID, kids are working on computers all the time, but that's where we've evolved to. At that time period, we were the first public school to have a laptop program. Um, there were some private schools that had them, but we were the first pu public school and it did spread to the other two middle schools in my district. So this was a really creative thing at the time, which is no longer seen as very creative because it's passe. I mean, it's happening all the time now. So anyway, that's the first way to develop your creativity. Another way is to be willing to show up and be seen with no guaranteed outcomes. And you can tell me, that's what we do every month when we go to receptions at the co-op. We come in, we don't know what's gonna happen. We come in and talk to people, we show them our artwork, drink a little wine, have some snacks, and we hope that somebody buys our artwork, but there's no guarantee. So you've gotta be willing to be comfortable with doing that, going out and being it without any guarantee. It's also what we do as artists when we do demonstrations, when we um, demonstrate to people our artwork. We hope we're gonna sell some artwork, but hey, there's no guarantee. It's what I'm doing right now. I'm here talking to you guys, and um, I might sell some books, that would be very nice, but there's no guarantee. So you have to just put yourself out there, and that's really an important way to develop your creativity. So a uh, third way is to make creating a priority. And this is, this does, I talk about this in my book because one of the things you need to do is do your artwork every day. So um, I can tell you another story from my life. In that time period when I wasn't doing any artwork, I was getting really kind of concerned because I knew I wanted to work on my art full time when I retired and I was really worried about being too rusty. I wasn't doing any artwork. I wasn't gonna be in practice. And so you'd think that would make me start doing artwork, wouldn't you? No, <laughs> it didn't. Remember, I had a really busy life, but I did start reading. I started reading about creativity, and I read um, Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way and her second book, A Vein of Gold. I read Elizabeth Gilbert's book, The Big Magic. Does that name ring a bell to anybody, Elizabeth Gilbert? Eat, Pray, Love? Yeah, yeah. She wrote a great book on creativity. And then I discovered Eric Maisel, who has, is a psychiatrist who specializes in creativity. And he has written at least 13 books. I know I've read 13 of his books. He might have written more since then, but he's written on creativity. And what I learned from Eric Maisel is art needs to be done every day. That stopped me short because I wasn't doing it. And I said, how can I possibly fit art into my 50-hour work week, my kids, my husband? I don't have any time. And I really sat back and thought about it. And I finally figured out what I could, how I could squeeze that artwork in. It doesn't have to be for a long period of time. I could give up 45 minutes of sleep. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. I got up 45 minutes early in the morning, went straight to my studio and painted for 45 minutes. Then I showered, went to work. Now, at the end of one year, I had a one-person show and sold several paintings. So that adds up. That 45 minutes a day, done every day, adds up. But um, the more important part of that story is that when I did my artwork in the morning, I could handle anything during the day. Any crisis that came up, any problem that came up, I could just handle it very smoothly. And that's partly because I had done what I wanted to do the first thing in the morning, but it's also partly because art balances us. It balances us out so well. So that is my story about making creating a priority, very important. Another one is, and I'm probably speaking to the choir here because it's become a part of a group of like-minded people. 
And if you're in this room right now, you're probably here with somebody that has the same interest of you in art, and maybe you're talking to somebody. And how many of you belong to art associations? Yep. Okay, that's great. That's like-minded people. And I can tell you that I get so inspired when I go to one of my um, art association meetings because I see what other artists are doing and I say, gosh, I can do that. <laughs> or maybe I can do better than that. <laughs> you know, but it does inspire me. It keeps me going to see that other people are out there doing it. So that's really an important one. This last one, the fifth one, I think is the most fun. This is each year select one thing that scares you or is something you've dreamt about doing. Isn't that interesting? Um, I'm going to give some examples from my life again. Three years ago, I went with my uh, daughter and son-in-law to Costa Rica. And on our list of activities that we were going to do was zip lining. And I said, that's fine, because I had zip lined before, about 15 years before, when they first started zip lining. I was in Costa Rica, and we climbed a tree and zip lined through the cloud forest. We were off the ground, but not that far. You, I mean, it's like being on a ski lift. You, if you fell, you, wouldn't, you might break a leg, but that's about it. It wasn't that bad. And so I thought, oh, that'll be fun. I'll, I'll like doing that. And so we got to the place where we're going to go zip lining. And we got, got up to a cable car. And we got into a cable car. And I said, hmm, this is a little different. This isn't just climbing a tree. And that cable car went, took us all the way up to the top of a cliff, way up. We could look down and see the jungle forest down below, way down below. And they said, you're going to zip line all the way to the bottom. <laughs> I'm a little afraid of heights, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll confess. And so I was a little freaked out by this. But we got all of our, our equipment on and everything. And then the guy was very nice. He, he recognized that I was a little bit freaked out by this. And so he went with me. And what we did was we took one long run down and hit a platform and stopped. Then we, then we were supposed to go on down six more times on various zip lines till we reached the bottom. So after that first one with the guide with me, I said, hmm, this, this isn't too bad. I mean, he's done this lots of times and he's still walking around. So. <laughs> and I've never heard of anyone actually dying from zip lining. So this is probably okay. So I did do the rest of them by myself and it was exhilarating. I would just go down and see Oh, this landscape laid out before me every time we took another one of our little um, lines. And I have to tell you that has had a big influence on my abstract art. If you look at my abstract art, you're going to see the distance in that art. And I really do think of this time. It comes back in my mind when I'm working on artwork. So that was three years ago. Last two years ago, Again, I was with my daughter and my son-in-law, and they seem to be the catalyst for these exciting <laughs> adventures. And we went on another trip, and we went to um, uh, Spain. We were in Sevilla. And um, my son-in-law said to me, we're going to take a tour of the cathedral, the Sevilla Cathedral. And I said, oh, right up my alley. Wonderful. I love going down that middle aisle and seeing those beautiful stained glass windows and seeing the statues and everything. So we got to the cathedral. We did not go down the middle aisle. We went over to the side to this little door that inside had steps that went up in a circular pattern. And they went up and up. These cathedrals are really tall. Yeah. Up and up and up. And we ended up on the roof of the cathedral. Same as my son-in-law had organized a tour of the roof of the cathedral. <laughs> So here I am with my a little bit of uh, fear of heights, but we could see all over the city of Sevilla. But what was most interesting to me on that trip was the guide pointed out on the floor. Uh, I have to tell you that the floor of the roof of the cathedral is not flat. It's undulating. It follows the curves of the um, arches below. And on this flooring, there was this something engraved in the floor of an arc. And around this arc were kind of trapezoid shapes 
this was what the master builder in 1500 and something drew on the ground to show the stonemasons how to cut the stones to make the arch that was above us. Mm -hmm. And that was fascinating to me. And that's another thing that influences my art. If you look at my abstract art, there a lot of times there's arches in them, and every time I put an arch in, I think of this arch. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. <laughs> so okay, that was two years ago. Last year, I couldn't go on any trips. <laughs> None of us could. It was COVID. I was teaching a class at the community college and my class was getting smaller because a lot of the people didn't want to be exposed to COVID and so they weren't signing up. And then at one point the um, community college shut down my class completely, just said, no, we're not holding any more classes. So here I am stuck at home. My students are stuck in their homes and I'm thinking, how can I teach? I can't even go to a classroom. And then I thought, I went to think, it says something you've dreamt about. Well, something I always dreamt about doing was putting my lessons on film, you know, online. And so I thought, well, here's my chance. I'm gonna do it. So I bought a camera, that camera right in the back there. And I found a um, boom. A boom is something that holds the camera above a table so you can um, see what you're doing on the table. I bought the tripod so that, um, I could have a film of me, my face, and I had to edit all this stuff, so I had to buy an editing program. I talked around, I asked all my friends about, can you teach me how to edit? I've never edited any film. Well, either they didn't know how to do it, or they were so busy doing their own editing of their own films that they were doing, nobody could help me, so I just had to do it trial and error. And I will tell you that that first lesson that I did, I had to do 14 takes before it was anywhere near good enough to show to anybody. So it was a trial and error thing all the way. But I now have three courses online. Um, one is water media and mixed media, and it's uh, 12 lessons, four for beginners, four for intermediate, and four for advanced. I have one that's water, uh, water color batik, that's two lessons. And then I have one that's called the painter's toolbox that is 14 lessons that is how to use common household objects to paint with <laughs> in your home. So anyway, so I've got all those online and people are buying them and so that's kind of that's kind of fun. That's what I did this year as my scary things, yeah, but also something I dreamt about. Okay, so da 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 I have a couple other things to add in besides those five. And the first one is to embrace routine and produce abundance. And embracing a routine, I said, remember I said art has to be done every day. You know, what I found is musicians know this. I took piano lessons for five years, classical piano. My music teacher said, you have to practice an hour every day. And man, if I didn't practice an hour every day, she knew it because my lessons were awful. <laughs> but musicians know that. They do their music every day. Dancers absolutely know it because they can't move if they don't practice every day. And most writers know that also because most writers start the day out by writing for an hour before they start their day. So they put an hour of writing in the morning. Most visual artists I find do not know that, that it has to be done every day. They don't have a routine. What most visual artists do is they do their day job all week and say, okay, but I'm gonna spend all day Saturday painting. Well, Saturday comes along and excuse me, the laundry needs to be done, the groceries need to be purchased, the kids need to be taken to soccer practice. You don't get a whole day of doing art. You nowhere near get what you would have put in if you put in a few times every day during the week to do it. So that's really important. And then the other part of it is it's to produce um, abundance. And there's a, um, Bales and Orlando are um, authors who wrote a book called um, Art and Fear. And in that book they talk about a ceramics teacher, and I think this is a true story, I can't guarantee it, but I think it is, who split his class in half. And one half, he said to them, if you 
want an A in this class, you have to produce one perfect pot this semester. One perfect pot. That's all. You could finish it in the next three or four days and be free for the rest of the semester, but that's, all, that's what you need to do to get an A in this class. The other half of the class, he said, what you have to do is turn out a pot every single day. You have to do a pot every day. I don't care if it's the crappiest pot you ever did, you have to do one pot every day for the whole semester. You get an A at the end. Now, which of these two groups do you think outshone the other? The abundance. The ones that went for abundance. Because when you go for abundance, you might turn out some really bad stuff, but some of that is going to shine. It's going to be so much better than if you just did once. So um, the other advice that I have is to stay foolish. You know, one of my teachers was Jane Hofstetter. She's a very well-known uh, watercolorist, wonderful artwork. And um, she used to talk about a laundry line that was on the imaginary laundry line that went from one end of the room to the other. And up here at this end of the laundry line is Picasso. And down here at this end of the line is where you are. And your stuff is probably pretty mediocre, certainly not on Picasso's level. But if you keep doing it, you're going to move up that line. Little by little, you're going to get better and better and better. You may not ever get up to Picasso, but you're going to get a lot closer than when you started. So mediocrity can be taken care of in increments. Um, mediocrity is still on the spectrum. It's better than not doing anything. You know, um, amateur artists think that doing any, even a rudimentary something is better than doing nothing. And you know what? They're right. They're absolutely right. So being an amateur is not conceding that you will always be an amateur. It's not conceding that mediocrity is the goal. What is conceding is that to become a pro and to stay a pro, you have to be a fool again and again. There was a Japanese tea artist. You know, the tea ceremony in Japan is an art form. And he was, he was a Japanese tea man. And he went out looking for a new teapot and he found the most beautiful teapot. He just found a beautiful teapot. And he took that teapot and he said, you know, I'm going to ask my master to come over and have tea with me. And he's going to admire my beautiful pot. He's going to just be so impressed. And so he set up his teapot and all the accoutrements around and invited his master over. Well, the master came over and they drank their tea and they talked about their art and they talked about politics. They talked about the world around them, drank some more tea. Then the master said, oh, well, I have to go. So thank you. It was very nice, good tea and everything. And he left. The, the tea man was so upset. He said, I didn't even notice my pot, my beautiful teapot that I spent so much money on and my master didn't even notice it and he smashed it against the wall and it broke into a million pieces and he just went out of the room. Well his students came in and saw the master's beautiful teapot in pieces on the floor and they were appalled because they knew how much he loved this teapot. So they picked up all the pieces and took it back to the workshop and they glued all the pieces together with gold and gave it back to the master. The master saw that this was even more beautiful than when he had first bought it. So you have to remember that your cracks, your fault lines, and your unique contours are where your gold reside. Now creation doesn't ask that you don't learn from others. You know, you can. Because Kandinsky learned from the Impressionists. We know that. He studied the Impressionists before he went on to become the first abstract artist. And then Matisse studied Picasso before he you know, came up with his own style. But this can't be the only source. You have to go inside and develop your distinctive style and your personal view as an artist. 
So never make what makes you original and distinctive be snuffed out. In the 1980s, a group of psychi psychologists, not psychiatrists, psychologists, wanted to know what made people creative. And so they got together some actively creative people and they put them in a house together to live together and interact and then they would sit and observe what these people were doing. And they also um, gave them intelligence tests and um, personality tests and they just studied these people to see what is it that makes someone creative. They thought they were going to find truly gifted people, people with intelligence that off the charts. They didn't. These people had pretty average intelligences, but what they did find is they had some characteristics that were really unique to creative people. There were seven characteristics, and the first one was an openness to one's inner life. Remember when I said you have to go inside and find out what makes you original and distinctive? And they did that. They were open to their in inner life. They had a preference for complexity and ambiguity. They liked puzzles. They liked to figure things out. They were real learners. And they had an unusually high tolerance for disorder and disarray. <laughs> and I can tell you, I don't know about the rest of you artists in here, but if you go to my studio right now, I got three different things I'm working on, and it probably looks pretty disordered and disarrayed. But the next characteristic is the ability to extract order from chaos. <laughs> so even though my studio may look disordered to someone else, I can find everything in it. I know right where everything is, so I can do that. They're also independent and unconventional. And you know, I go back to those middle school kids, those discipline problems. They were very independent, unconventional. I'm sure they grew up to be very creative kids. And I actually talked to some of their parents and said, don't worry, he's gonna be fine. And they did turn out fine in the end. And then they have a willingness to take risks. So I can tell you right now, as an artist, facing that blank canvas or that blank piece of paper is the riskiest thing in the world to do, you know? And every time I do it, I'm taking a risk. So that's the characteristics of um, these creative people. But they also had, I talked a little about the learning style that they really liked ambiguity. There are two basic learning styles that people have. And one is an entity theorist who believes that they have a limited amount of intelligence. They can only do so much and that's it. It caps out. And so when they come across this entity person, when they come across something that's difficult for them, they stop doing it and go back to something that's comfortable. They stay in their comfortable range. They, this is the person that when you ask them if they can draw, they'll say, no, I can't draw. Without ever trying to figure out the steps it would take to learn how to draw. These people in this uh, study of creative people in the 1980s were learning theorists. And what they found was that there was no problem that they couldn't tackle. They worked on the problems by looking at them in increments. And so if you asked them if they could draw, they said, well, not yet, but, and they would start going through the steps of learning how to draw. And what they found about these two types of learning is that they're pretty much in, come with the person when they're very, very young. They're instilled in them from very young. And so they kind of become self-fulfilling prophecies. The entity theorists don't do new things, don't learn new things. They stay in their comfort zones. And the learning theorists go on to become, you know, learn a lot more things. But, you know, my theory, I, and I know this is the theory that kids are set this way very young, but I really feel that we can affect whether a child is an entity person or a learning type um, person by what we say to them. When someone says to a child, well, you're never going to be an artist, so you just better stick with math or something. That is one of those things that goes into a kid's head and stays there forever. They never think they're going to be an artist again. So that's something to keep in mind. So we can really change that. So, but in the long run, the learning theorists feel that painful failures may prove much more valuable than gains. 
And those people that are armed with a healthy attitude, like the learning theorists, are able to draw wisdom from every experience, whether it's good or bad. Brilliant creations all often come from small errors. So if you want to develop your creativity, there are three questions you have to ask yourself. Who can I become? What can I accomplish? And what impact can I have? If you ask yourself those three questions, you're going to get there. Because we have to keep in mind that as you and I create, we are also creating the world that we live in, which has been done through the ages. So that's my talk. This is my book. <laughs> My book is not like my talk. It's, uh, it's about the grind. It really is. It's starting out as saying that if you're an artist and you want to make a career of your artist, you really want to be a selling professional artist, these are the steps you have to take. And it's split into 12 chapters, and at the end of each chapter are a series of tasks to be done. Most of these tasks can be at least started within a week and maybe finished within a week. Some have to be continued on for the rest of your life. But my idea of somebody reading this book would be that they would read a chapter a week, and at the end of a week, and the end of three months, that would be 12 weeks, they would be ready to be a selling artist. So these are just all the, and these are the steps I've taken to get to my, where I am right now. So anyway, anybody have any questions? I've been talking, talking, talking. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you, you. <laughs> Question. Go ahead, go ahead. What, what's your next risk? My oh yeah, what's going to be next? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't I don't know. I don't know. I've I've actually been starting. I've been working on it actually. I've been studying Italian every day. I put in time studying Italian. I would like I'm I had plans to go to Italy and it's fall, they've fallen through. I'm not going to get there right now, but sometime I'm going to go to Italy and I'm going to talk to somebody in Italian. <laughs> 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 so, anyway. You hit home when you said that the Make the coffee. Go to my studio first. I'm going to try for 45 minutes yeah. before the dogs break down the door. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, the reason I came up with 45 minutes was I needed my sleep. I figured I could maybe do without 45 minutes of sleep, but I couldn't do without an hour of sleep. <laughs> so I kind of got it down to that. But yeah. But challenge me. Oh, good. Good. Good try challenge. That tomorrow. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you brought up COVID and you overcame challenge by being creative, staying creative through COVID. What other relationships with other artists have they explained to you how, how they got through it? You know, it's really interesting. COVID was really hard for a lot of people, but you know who it was least hard on? Was artists. I've talked to so many artists that said, oh, I didn't mind COVID. Nobody interrupted me. I got to work in my studio. I didn't have to go to meetings and things like that. I, I had time to do my art. So I'm really thinking artists are, artists are basically loners in some ways. I mean, because you have to be alone to do your art. You have to have it quiet. You can have music on, but you can't be interrupted. You need to be alone. But it affected so many traveler, traveling art shows. Yes, it did. And so was that an impact psychologically to them that they couldn't get out you know, to an art show and exhibit their art? Yes, I've, I've heard that because I'm also a docent at the museum. And one of the things we started doing during COVID was virtual tours. We were doing tours online, which was better than nothing. Yeah. But it doesn't take the place of actually being there. Right. And definitely when COVID was, is 
pretty much over now. I think people are really loving being able to be back in the museum, back seeing things in person. But um, yeah, that's that. This is an interesting time that we're going to remember for a long time in the future. I think. I think it's almost created a new renaissance because the internet has become so available to artists. I mean, everything is pictures, 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 and ideas, and yeah. putting sound together with imagery. Um, it's really a renaissance. Yeah. Well, it is. And I think, like with everything, there's a bad side to what happened with COVID, and there's also a good side. And certainly the technology, we're using technology a lot more than we ever have before. We've learned how to do Zoom meetings. We've learned how to, you know, we weren't doing that to a great extent. Not most of us weren't. My daughter was, because she, she's a marketing person that works out of her home. <laughs> so she, she does that everything on the computer anyway. But, um, but most of us weren't doing that. And so we we've been introduced to that and we've learned a lot and those of us that are kind of in the older part the non-digital people have learned some digital tools to use it's hard for a lot of people yeah yeah so if anybody wants one of my books do you, you want to sell the books through the gallery right yes yes and i will but i will sign them excellent I'll so. one